We're constructing a raised bed behind the garage here for some partial shade loving plants. And later on, Joey's going to show how Epsom salt benefits you and your garden. That and a whole lot more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. This program was funded by the following. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. Dollarseed.com, what could be healthier? Willow Spring Soap Company is a locally owned Colorado business just a stone's throw away from the Rocky Mountains. Their handmade soap is made from simple, recognizable ingredients, which lead to a more natural, earth-friendly, long-lasting, and hard bar with a wonderful creamy lather. They make soap using the cold kettle process with a specially formulated recipe of 100% vegetable oils. They use traditional methods that produce a true soap instead of the commercial synthetic alternatives that can dry out skin. Go to www.willowspringsoap.com to get a fresh and natural clean handmade in the Rockies. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener supports the following. Hunger Task Force believes that every person has the right to adequate food obtained with dignity. They're providing food for people in need. With their 151 acre working farm and fish hatchery in Franklin, Wisconsin, volunteers are needed daily. You could plant seeds in the greenhouse, ride the transplanter, or you can make an instant $10 donation from your mobile device by texting food to 52000. For more information on how you can help in hunger, visit HungerTaskForce.org. Welcome to Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joey Baird. This show is dedicated to the average gardener, simple home living, and using what you already have. We're on the back side of the garden today, behind the garage, and we're going to construct a small raised bed out of some items that we found along the side of the road, some scrap lumber. Now, it's going to be small. It's one foot wide by six and a half foot long. And the reason why we're doing this is for some shade loving, partial shade loving plants. And typically partial shade means between four and five hours of sunlight or a little less. So the basic construction of this, we found uh, some hard, uh, this looks, I believe this was ash, and we painted it green just so the moisture wouldn't absorb into the wood. And we cut it down to the, the size that we had, had, which was one foot wide. And we wanted to keep it one foot wide because we wanted to be able to get the lawnmower through and to cut around the perimeter of the garden because in the area that we live in, we have to keep three foot off adjacent property. So we, we have accomplished that. Now, you could go about constructing this raised bed by putting screws in the sides and constructing it that way to make it nice and, and solid. Well, we're just going to basically friction fit it together, meaning we're going to take these sticks here or this scrap lumber and we're going to just hammer in the boards on the outside so when the soil hits the inside, it will have some stu uh, structure to it and it won't collapse on itself. So basically, we're just going to put it, the, uh, the uh, bed together here. Basic, uh, just need a hammer. Get it nice and tight against the uh, board there. And I'm going to let it hang above just a little bit. Now I want to get this side down here a foot away from the wall, which is where it's at there. And this is the smaller piece that we have because our, the boards that we found was different sizes. So we're going to uh, add on to the long portion of the front of the bed here. So I want to get the sides together and then we can get this front all solid together with the stakes. So that's right, right there. So on the sides, I'm just going to put one stake because that will hold it. The sides
And these stakes that I'm using, they're about 14 inches long. I just took some scrap lumber we had in the shed and cut it down to about 14, 12, 14 inches long. All right, now that we've got that, I'm gonna work on the smaller portion and we're going to just put one board. And as you see, I'm putting it on this outside for two reasons. One, so when the dirt hits it, like I said, it will push against it and it'll hold our walls up. And two, so we have more growing space on the inside because if I were to put the board there and have to screw to it, we would be losing not much, but, ver but uh, some growing space. And in this little area, every uh, inch is valuable. So I'm gonna get this nice and tight up against our side there. And All right, now we're gonna go with a long portion here. We've already put up stake on this corner here. So with a long portion, I'm gonna put two more. And the way I'm going to do where the separation is here, I'm gonna take the widest scrap lumber I have and split the difference so there's a support on both sides. And so we'll do that one first. And we'll just split the center here. Now, what are we gonna plant in our box behind the garage in partial shade? Well, there's a couple of uh, different vegetables you can grow in this box. Uh, beans being one, leafy greens, Brussels sprouts. It would be another, beets is another one. And you can do research online to give you a list of vegetables that will grow in partial shade. Not everything will, so you want to do your research before you go about and planting stuff in the box if you have an area where you could construct a small bed like this and grow more vegetables for your family. So now that we've got our bed constructed, we're going to take some good organic topsoil and we're just going to fill in the bed. And we're using the concrete foundation of the garage as the back support of our bed otherwise we'd have to put another board back there and then we'd actually have to physically screw everything together but since we can use the concrete as a wall that actually benefits us so we got one bucket in there and now if you want to know how much soil to put in your bed there's different uh, websites online to where you can put in the dimensions of your bed with height and length and it will give you the cubic feet that will be required if you have to purchase soil for your bed. Let's see where we're at. Now I'm not going to go all the way to the top of the board here. I'm gonna leave about an inch so when it rains, it doesn't flush the soil out. It allows the soil to penetrate and go through the bed. And as you can see back here where we had, this soil looked just like where the bed was. And we went in there and kind of loosened it up a little bit so there is some, uh, the drainage is a little bit better. Now, if you're doing this in an area of your yard where you have grass, you can put cardboard down to smother out the grass and then you can construct your bed on top of it or you can put a weed barrier uh, in that instance as well. So we just, uh, I'm gonna say two more buckets here. We'll finish the completion of our soil. And I'm gonna fill it just a little bit higher than I'm gonna slightly tap it down and because it's going to settle some. All right, looks good. I already got a few worms in there. All right, so now, now that we've got it constructed, it's time to start planting the seeds. So that's what we're going to do right now. So we got our bed constructed here and we're going to plant or begin the stages of planting. Now, 
But any time that you're going to plant in a small bed like this, you want to remember what the end result of the vegetable or herb or green that you're going to plant will be. We're going to plant some Swiss chard here. We're going to plant two plants. Now, a mature Swiss chard plant is going to get 12 to 18 inches tall and about 6 inches wide. So you don't want to take these icicle radishes and put them right up next to it because you think you're going to save space. It's not going to work. You're going to shade the radishes out or you're going to shade, one of them is going to have a disadvantage on the other. So it's just best to evenly space, even though early when you're planting it looks like, oh, I'm wasting a lot of space here. You're not uh, because the end result will show that uh, these plants will expand, grow, and fill in the box very nicely. So we're going to take the Swiss chard and I'm going to plant two Swiss chard seeds on the end here. So white fort, fort, uh, fort hooks there. Right here I'm going to plant some white icicle radishes. Now with the bed being a foot wide I'm going to go one, two, I'm going to go three. You may think that's kind of crazy. Well I want them to expand out like they, they grow like a carrot these icicle radishes and I want them to penetrate down and I want them to have a good diameter on them. So we'll just plant those. All right. And then the undive greens here we're going to plant next to the radishes and these are smaller seeds so I'm just kind of maybe put four, four or five, I'm going to do a little trench there. And I'm just going to kind of very gently since these are extremely tiny I'm just going to try to do my best to space them. I'm not doing a very good job there. But they'll come up and if I have to thin them out I can eat them uh, then. So we'll just progressively go down through the raised bed here and plant a, uh, plant a lot of our partial shade loving plants. Uh, beets for the instance of this box we would plant two beets per the one foot width and with the loose soil there will be very large bulbs on them. So we can pack a lot of vegetables in this little space in the partial shade. So just because you have partial shade doesn't mean you can't grow vegetables. You just have to be specific on what type you want to grow or can grow that like partial shade. So you want to do your research before you start planting in your garden whether it's a raised bed or a traditional ground garden. Do your research and find out what vegetable grows best in partial shade or full sun and you can have good tasting vegetables all summer long. Shallots are part of the onion family, but they have a much milder taste in flavor. They can be pickled or be cut up in a salad and they don't overwhelm the, the uh, food that you're putting it in. Now, shallots, unlike onions, grow similar to garlic. I got a couple examples here. You would plant one of these bulbs in the ground and all these other bulbs will emerge from that one bulb, very similar to what garlic does. So you can save the smaller bulbs, these are organic ones we got last year, and you can save these smaller ones, break them apart, and then plant them in the ground. Now I was doing some work on the high end of the garden there, and I found some that we planted last uh, June, July, that we had a really dry summer, and it didn't, they didn't come up, but they did, they have already now. So what I'm going to do is, and you can kind of see the same kind of structure here from the ones that we've cured to the ones that's, uh, that's came up. So I very carefully dug them out of the ground and I'm just going to plant this whole lot back in the ground as I did find them on the high end of the garden. And we're going to put them here and we're going to plant all of them together. We're going to plant the uh, ones that have come in up in one row and then the ones that have not started yet in the other and we'll see how they do. Um, if you do find vegetables like that, they're coming up in random spots in your garden. You can always, uh, if they're like onions or shallots or tomatoes for instance, you can very delicately dig them up and move them to a better portion of the garden or where you're going to put that particular crop for the year. So a couple things with these shallots, with these that have come up already, I'm just going to bury them back the way I found them in the ground and just cover them up. Now with the ones that have been cured and have not had any growth on them, I'm going to take 
and just gently push them down just like an onion set bulb with the root portion in the ground and now for some reason in a lot of areas pigeons like these things well they don't like to eat them they like to come by and pull them out of the ground and nibble on them and say I don't like this one let me try the next one if you have problems with pigeons pulling your shallots out of the ground after you plant them you can put some kind of netting over top of them to protect them until the roots get established so I'm going to take for instance here you can see very easily the um, one that I pulled out of the garden that was one bulb that has begun to separate and grow two stalks out of it now I'm not no shallop expert and if you are uh, let us know if we're doing the right thing here by just digging them from one end and placing them to the other. I, I don't see that it's going to hurt. They're very hardy, uh, very tough plant. They're kind of like, you know, like I said, like onions. So I'm going to plant this one uh, down there. Now when you're planting your onions, you want to go, or you're planting your shallops that is, you want to space them about seven to nine inches apart to give them proper growth so when they expand and they put their bulb on, they're not pinched against one another. Now last year, we planted ours in some dresser drawers. They did really well. So you don't have to plant them in the ground. You can plant them in a raised bed or a container. Does quite well also. And if you've never planted shouts, go ahead and try it. Stores still have some sets out there. They are a little more on the pricey side than traditional onion bulb sets but if you do like we did and have the organic kind then you can save them from year after year plant the smaller ones and you can continue your shallop uh, harvest for years to come with just a minimal amount of cost so it's just that easy to plant shallops in your garden Computers are a wonderful piece of technology when they work, but at some point your computer is going to die on you. What do you do with it? Well, if you have a tower, you've probably got it in storage somewhere, like I do, thinking someday you're going to get that baby fixed. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not going to happen, so you might as well think other ways to use your broken computer for. What can you do with it? Well, you can take the contents out of the center of it and try to sell it to some high school kid who thinks he knows what he's doing with it. And you can take the shell and recycle it. Well, for us, it's about nine cents a pound when that doesn't pay very good. But what you can do is you can have technology pay you back in the garden. What am I talking about? Well, you can take your broken computer, get the insides of it like we have with this one we found along the side of the road, and turn it into a raised bed to grow you better and more vegetables in your garden. What do we got to do? Well, it's pretty easy construction on this one. Right beside the raised bed we made earlier, we've got a computer here that has one side that comes off. Now, sometimes your tower will have doors on both sides, and that works just as well because then you can actually have vegetables penetrate through the soil you put in your raised bed and into the actual ground. So we've got a lot of holes in this computer here. Well, you can take these bags that every store gives you, and you can kind of fill in the, the holes. Like, for instance, the back here, we're just going to kind of gently tuck that in there because we're going to put soil in here and it'll just kind of prevent it from running out. Now if you have a computer tower that has uh, a solid side on it, you want to drill holes in it so drainage of the water will happen properly. So we're going to take the larger portion that's open here and we're going to put that up against the back of the garage here and kind of fill in some of the holes here with our plastic bags. Now that we've done that, we want to take our soil that we've got and fill in the base. That's one. Let's maneuver it around here and try to get everything fitted properly. Let's get another bag here. Now this will work good if you have, if you want to use this 
out away from partial shade, but we're doing ours in partial shade. Now there's a tip for that. Because it's metal, it's gonna heat up a lot quicker than a wood bed or a plastic raised bed would. So what you can do is take your soil and fill up around the edges like this to keep the sunlight off that metal to keep your soil cooler inside so you don't bake your vegetables that you're growing and you can keep the soil moist on the outside which will keep the metal cooler which will in turn keep your vegetables happier so now that we've got the inside of the computer tower filled we're going to plant some leaf lettuce that likes partial shade and all we're going to do is the soil is nice and loose now this was where the CD-ROM went so we won't plant on that corner but we're going to take and gently broadcast the seeds across the whole computer tower here and we'll take some soil and get that covered there. So just another way you can reuse items you already have and now it's the time that technology is going to pay you back with some really good lettuce for supper come about a month and a half from now. We're up here on the high end of the garden today and we're where we're going to plant tomatoes and we're going to help the tomatoes out before we even get them in the ground. Well, how are we doing that? We're adding some magnesium sulfate to the soil, more simply known as household Epsom salt. Now you can purchase household Epsom salt at your local big box store for a few dollars. We got this six pound bag of Epsom salt here and it's just granules. We got this for about a dollar a pound. Now, why is it important to add Epsom salt to your soil? Well, Epsom salt is a magnesium sulfate, which is what Epsom salt is. Uh, your plants need that, uh, the chlorophyll in your plants need that to make the plants greener and healthier. And also, whenever you plant tomatoes, you may have seen this in the past where you have a beautiful tomato on the vine and underneath it's totally black and, and rotted. It's because it's a calcium deficiency and magnesium sulfate will actually help prevent that. So all we're going to do is every little spot here where we're planning on planting tomatoes, we're just going to put a handful of Epsom salt in that spot and by the time we plant tomatoes the rain will have soaked it in the soil to dispute, uh, uh, mix it in the soil uh, properly. Now depending on whether you've planted tomatoes or not you can still do this and you can search online and find out how much Epsom salt you should mix with a gallon of water and water your tomatoes with. It'll also help decrease the dead foliage that your plants, your tomato plants, uh, begin to experience through the growing season. The old timers will say you should use Epsom salt around every plant in the, in the garden and that's totally up to you and you'll need to do your research for your particular area, your particular soil and what you're growing. We feel it is an excellent thing to do to help increase that plant's health. Now this tip and information came from a guy in Texas, you may have heard of him, by the name of Bob Webster. He has a couple of nurseries down there and he's been growing tomatoes for years and he's got a surefire way on how to grow the biggest and best tomatoes that you've ever grown. Now for the link on his seminar, we'll have it in the show notes in, on our webpage. And it's the same name as our show, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. And also on the right hand side, we've typed up basically a little brief uh, of what a uh, briefing of what Bob says you should do on the right hand side of our page under how to grow tomatoes. So just add a little Epsom salt or magnesium sulfate to your soil and it will help increase the productivity and the health of your tomato plants come this year. Well, that's all the time we have. Hope you enjoyed the show as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Finishing up planting this raised bed here with some beets. As you can see, this raised bed was really easy to construct. We didn't have to have any nails or screws. We just had to have some good organic soil and some boards that we found along the side of the road. And you can construct one too as elaborate or as simple as you want it to be. 
and planting those shallots. Those are a sweet delicacy that with a little milder taste than an onion that if you haven't grown before, really easy to grow, go ahead and put some in the ground and you'll be growing them from now on year after year. For all of us here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, I'm Joy Baird encouraging you, take a child gardening and start growing some memories. This program was funded by the following. At dollarseed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit dollarseed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. Dollarseed.com. What could be healthier? Willow Spring Soap Company is a locally owned Colorado business just a stone's throw away from the Rocky Mountains. Their handmade soap is made from simple, recognizable ingredients, which lead to a more natural, earth-friendly, long-lasting, and hard bar with a wonderful creamy lather. They make soap using the cold kettle process with a specially formulated recipe of 100% vegetable oils. They use traditional methods that produce a true soap instead of the commercial synthetic alternatives that can dry out skin. Go to www.willowspringsoap.com to get a fresh and natural clean handmade in the Rockies. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener supports the following. Hunger Task Force believes that every person has the right to adequate food obtained with dignity. They're providing food for people in need. With their 151-acre working farm and fish hatchery in Franklin, Wisconsin, volunteers are needed daily. You could plant seeds in the greenhouse, ride the transplanter, or you can make an instant $10 donation from your mobile device by texting FOOD to 52000. For more information on how you can help in hunger, visit HungerTaskForce.org. The show never ends on our Facebook page. Keyword, Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Like the page and continue the discussion there. You can now follow us on Twitter, see what we're up to and what we're doing at the garden. The address, the W-I Veg Gardener, G-A-R-D-E-N-R. You can email us at the W-I Veg Gardener at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or suggestions about the show. Thank you.